Good morning, adventurers. My name is Ben, and welcome to a morning show where I sit around, drink some tea, and talk about D&D. Mm. First up for T&D today, we have the Touch Me, I'm Vaccinated mug from Cancun, Mexico, where I have never been. Um, don't touch random people just because they're vaccinated, but, you know, it's still a fun mug. Uh, and inside of it, we have some Shadowfell Slumber, because it is very late at night right now, and um, I'm a little bit sleepy, but not sleepy enough to not be doing this right now. So, <clears throat> let's get on to what we are actually talking about today. Today we are talking about using non-traditional creatures as uh, civilizations in your home game. Um, now, you might be saying, what exactly does that mean? Um, and it goes into a couple of things that I've talked about in the past, actually. Uh, it, it essentially, at the core of it, means using pretty much any creature type that you want to as a civilization in your game. Um, really what it breaks down to ultimately is peeling back whatever sort of like built in uh, view of those individual, individual creatures that you might have, there might be in general, uh, and breaking it down and turning them into something that is actually interactable with the party instead of just being like, ah, bad guy, or ah, unintelligent mob of beasts. Um, it's actually something that a lot of people are doing, uh, particularly starting with the racist section of D&D, &D, um, in trying to break down the sort of like baked in racism in a lot of D&D &D lore uh, as we pull from stuff that is outdated from the 70s to bring into uh, modern day. Uh, it's 50 years ago that things have changed. And so there are people on the like in it doing some good work in trying to break that down trying to like really push wizards to break past a lot of those things and this is actually a way that you can uh start to think in that same vein obviously if you're just doing it in your home game it's not going to be like changing anything for uh the greater scope of everything but it is a good way to sort of like enforce at your table that you are looking past maybe what has been put on uh, some of these individuals um, and just trying to make it a more interactable world because ultimately everything in the world has some kind of a culture associated with it and that culture is something that people should be able to interact with uh, in a positive manner if they are approaching it with an <laughs> open mind curiosity uh, and so let's go ahead and let's dive into uh, a couple of examples specifically of what I am actually talking about here. So, when I say uh, all of that, what I am getting at is that you should have a bunch of uh, different sort of civilization settlements, that kind of thing, in your game that people would maybe look at normally, normally, from a certain perspective, as evil or as uncivilized or something like that. Um, actually, a really good example of this in popular D&D uh, &D media is uh, in Campaign 2 of Critical Role, mild spoilers, I guess. Uh, they go to Jorhas, which is the generally seen as wildly uncivil uncivilized monstrous evil because they are largely run by drow. They have monster cities. They have all of these different things. And so going there then they get to interact with all of these and they have wildly different lifestyles and cultures than uh our protagonists are used to but they are shown to be perfectly well civilized individuals they have cities they have laws they have uh, power structures in place it's just the other side of the coin that uh a lot of times people from that original perspective are refusing to see and so throwing some of these into your game helps to add um an air of uh, contention in terms of morality because you are realizing that these people are not just monsters they are actual people who are trying to live their lives trying to do their thing and it adds uh, a layer of depth to your world as a whole because you are fleshing out uh, the other side of the fence essentially in a way that is not inherently problematic um, as long as you aren't leaning into those stereotypes that a lot of these have baked into them so the examples that I was talking about um, first off, I have a couple of them that I have used in my games, um, and I really, really do like, and I think they're really cool. So we're going to go with those first. Uh, the first one up is Merfolk. Uh, they are often in, uh, the, not often, they are billed in the Monster Manual DMG, uh, Monster Manual, not DMG. I don't know why I threw that one in there. 
Uh, they're built as evil. Um, and if they are not built as evil, they are built as neutral at best. Um, they are not ever built as good. They're not really built as lawful, I don't think, ever. When I'm saying build, I mean their, their little tag is not lawful, good, anything like that. And so they are built to be these bad guys that live underwater. However, in one of my games, I had them have massive sprawling underwater, underwater cities that could be explored, that they could interact with um, the players managed to get down there at one point uh and actually like got to go around this really really sort of spectacular underwater city think kind of like the gungans from um star wars episode one which i know is a fan favorite for everybody out there uh but they they had these sprawling metropolises way way down under the water uh filled with um bioluminescent algaes and stuff like that to keep light up in this area so that while they could see in the dark, they had some amount of light to go by it so that they could see colors. They weren't like overly straining their eyes or anything like that. It's little things like that, the touches that you can add, that make it feel like alive and real. Um, moving past the merfolk, I had uh, uh, several, actually at this point, giant cities. Uh, I used some of the things from Storm King's Thunder as sort of a basis for some stuff, but uh, each of the different types of giants could be intermingling in whatever cities they wanted to be, but I had several cities where uh, they were predominantly of a certain type of giant because that's where they were. So while you might find a storm giant in a uh, cloud giant city, the cloud giant city that is up in uh, the clouds is going to be predominantly built around uh, ease of use for cloud giants because that, that's the way it goes. A hill giant is going to have a hard time up there, but they can still be there. In inherently, they can still be there. Um, and everything was built to scale for giants. Uh, they harvested moisture directly out of the air. They harvested winds and things like that for uh, powering different things. And so it really sort of gave this different sort of lifestyle to these giants. And it made them not necessarily just these bu big bulky evil creatures that p people had to go fight. And I think that that is a really important piece of doing this justice it it needs to paint them in a relatable more human quote unquote we're going to use human because that's the real world term for it uh, a more human light a more uh, a light that you can actually see yourself in react or interact with in a way that is constructive and decent really ultimately <laughs> um, a few more of these that I haven't necessarily used yet, but I do really like. There's one more example of one that I, I have used that I'm going to save till the end because I it's my favorite. Um, but a few more of them that I haven't gotten to use yet, but I think are, would be really cool to be able to use, and I probably will at some point here. Uh, elementals. Getting away from strictly humanoids, having uh, civilizations of elementals in the different elemental planes, I think is a really, really cool option. Uh, and it makes it so that they are not just these mindless tornadoes or mindless rock monsters or something like that. Uh, if I were to go with that, I would probably take inspiration from some of the uh, Legend of Zelda temples, particularly if you go through Breath of the Wild, things like the Goron City. Um, I'm blanking on what the uh, bird city is called, the air temple city in like Breath of the Wild. Um, that that whole uh, sphere, use that as kind of like a jumping off point for maybe a couple of different ideas for how it might actually work and how they could interact with each other. Like maybe there's a city in the bottom of a volcano where fire elementals and rock elementals sort of co-mingle and have built up this lifestyle together. If you need a bridge, like if you really feel like there needs to be a bridge between like strict humanity, quote unquote, and these elemental beings, uh, throw some Genasi in there. They are the perfect go-between for that kind of thing and would be able to facilitate that relationship very, very well. Um, down from that, this one is actually very often and well done. Uh, it just has not come up in one of my games yet somehow. Uh, Devils and Demons, the Nine Hells, the Abyss, it, it's all very well mapped out. A lot of people have done it. Uh, City of Brass, that kind of thing. It's been done a lot. I just have never gotten around to being able to have it in one of my games. And so I think it's a really cool concept. I think it's a really cool thing to be able to implement into your game. Um, and getting to see that sort of the way that Devils and Demons operate is really cool. Now, Devils and Demons, 
because of like the polarity of the uh, planescape, oftentimes are billed as inherently evil. And that's really kind of why I have them on this list. I think it would be really interesting to sort of spin that so that devils and demons and then the celestial beings, it uh, I would make them interact with both of them. They are both inherently very selfish individuals in that instance. So there is actually this mirroring happening between them, and it once again sort of muddies the water of like, oh, this is bad from a perspective, but that's not the perspective that I have anymore. Um, and so I, I want to do devils, demons, angels, celestials, that kind of thing in in that light, because I think that'd be a really cool way to do it. Uh, further down from that, kind of like giants, but I'm genuinely kind of shocked this one hasn't happened yet. Yetis. J just yetis. Uh, I, I love using frozen environments in my games. So I don't really know how I didn't come across yetis yet uh, in this capacity, because I am absolutely game to do this. They could uh, be yetis. There would be frost giants around them. There'd be mammoths. Like, they're it'd be a really cool kind of thing. And it's a very easy one to kind of implement. It's been done a lot, actually, um, in a lot of different media. And it just, it's one that I really like, and it's one that I would want to, like, go ahead and put in there. Um, <laughs> this next one is another combo, uh, and I think that this one would just be fun, and it would really throw players for a loop. Um, it Awaken beasts, like wolves that can talk, or bears that can talk, or giant bees that can talk like anything that can talk that is an animal that would just be confusing to the players again with this one if it's a bridge too far you can have your go-betweens of uh, were beasts so werewolves were bears were rats like whatever the ones that can be people and also be these animals um would be a really good like sort of bridge between there and that but i don't think you need it i think that it is perfectly reasonable to just have this civilization and again all of these things would be built to facilitate the lives of these beasts. So the players who are, you know, these bipedal individuals walking through, more than likely, would be really, really thrown off by the doggy doors that lead into everything, or the fact that everything is lower because everybody's on four legs, or something like that. And so that kind of thing is really exciting to my brain, <laughs> and I, that is the kind of city that I want to build because it's so different from what you would traditionally get. Um, which brings me to the bottom of my list. The last thing that I've actually done, and one that I really, really liked doing, a city of dragons. Who's shocked? No one's shocked, right? Because it's me. I love dragons. I think they're amazing. I think they're the coolest things in the game. It's half of the name, uh, and honestly, the other half of the name, I could take or leave. But dragons? Dragons. So, the city of dragons that I built uh, was built not necessarily around like a hierarchy of... Uh, most power all the way down to least power age or anything like that it was more like a commune almost which was interesting in the context that we put it in because it was a series of dragons that shared wealth they were building a shared horde um, and for some reason that lore might become relevant at some point so I'm not just going to throw it out on the internet um, for some reason <laughs> they had agreed to work together. This was chromatics, metallics, gem dragons, all of them working together, building up this horde of wealth and living in general harmony together. They all had sort of like outreach territories where they were going to accumulate more wealth and to hunt and eat and stuff like that. But for the most part, there was no inner conflict among them. There was a little bit because that's how, you know, intelligent beings are they get in conflicts with each other but it wasn't like an all-out war between the chromatics the metallics the jet like it wasn't a three a, a, a three-way war that was going on they just they would get into scuffles together and they'd sort it out and they'd continue on but they lived normal-ish lives um i actually had it so that all of the dragons in here could shape change down to humanoid size if they wanted to but for the most part they spent their time in uh, draconic form the only time they would come down to humanoid size really would be for like town hall kind of meetings council kind of meetings where trying to fit you know 50 dragons just in a spot wasn't going to be great so they would just shrink down to person size they'd go and they'd sit down and they'd stand around and they'd talk worked out really well for me um and so using these non-traditional uh 
creature civilizations, these creature settlements, really add some more depth to your world. And if you do them right, it adds a whole other layer of storytelling to your world because most of these things are often billed as evil. They're made to be the villains. We are seeing the revolu the revolution, the over or the turnover. There we go of uh, goblins and orcs and uh, things of that nature to not be the bad guys anymore. They are player races. They are uh, player options. They are the villages that people will come across. They are cities that people will come across, where they are just normal people in the cities, and that's really great. And I have really enjoyed being able to use them as normal cities which is actually what sort of sent me down the path to trying to figure out more and more and more of these things that we could just make normal. <laughs> uh, and really, you can do this with anything. You can have a whole city of awakened shrubs if you want to. I'm going to write that down, actually, um, because I don't hate that idea. But um, the awakened shrub. There we go. Um, sorry. The whole thing with it is that you, it's a fantasy game you can do what you want you can have anything you want and in doing so you can really really put some depth into this make-believe world by giving anything more than just the skin of evil on it because that's boring that's that it's easy is what it is and it you don't want it to be easy is the thing because being easy it it's not as much fun <laughs> at the end of the day really um so use use your monster list. Get on the monster list and start scrolling. Find something your players are going to interact with and see how you can loop it into some kind of civilization. If you're like, man, it is a bridge too far for me to have bullets be uh, their own independent city. Make them pets of dwarves or something like that. Like give them a purpose in somebody else's settlement because it it ties it to... A feeling of humanity and that is what you want at the end of the day for this effect to actually be in your world for it to be the reality of this is all just from a different perspective and n none of these other beings are inherently evil unless you're like the evil dragon queen or something like that that's different so use them try to use them find ways to implement them because it's a lot of fun and it really will throw your players for a loop uh, that is everything I have to, I have to say on that Moving on to the shows that we have today and tomorrow. Today we have Dimension 20, Knocked Prone, Adventure Maidens, Trials and Trebuchets, and Roll Out. And then tomorrow we have, of course, Critical Role, Authors and Dragons, Nad Pod, and LGBT D&D. Go check them out. Let them know that I sent you because, again, someday somebody's going to say something to me about it. And I'm going to think that it's really funny. But nobody said anything to me about it yet. So I'm going to keep telling you until it actually happens. Uh, but... That is everything I have to talk to you guys about today. So, thank you so very much for making me part of your morning routine. I really do appreciate it. And thank you so much in particular to my patrons. You guys are the ones that make this show possible. If you're interested in becoming a patron, check out the link in the episode description. Um, and yeah, that's all of it. So, with all that said, don't forget everybody. Drink tea, play D&D, &D, and keep on rolling. <laughs>